Madison, Wisconsin. Um, we are one of a number of co-op development centers around the country. <coughs> to find the one nearest you, uh, you can go to the ncba.coop website and look for Cooperation Works. Um, CDS, uh, as one of those centers, also houses 16 independent consultants who specialize in food cooperatives, and we work with cooperatives throughout the United States. Uh, what we've seen in our work is that food cooperatives have had a number of development cycles in the United States. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s, there were a number of co-ops that organized around the country, um, uh, primarily in response to the needs of the time, the Depression, rationing in World War II, rural communities needing a grocery store. Uh, not too many of those survived. We estimate maybe fewer than 10 remain today. Then there was another wave of cooperative development in the late 60s and early 70s. And in that era, we estimate between 500 and 800 food co-ops formed as a part of the social change movement of the time. Uh, and again, we, we estimate that about 250 of those have survived and many, many of those are thriving today. In the last 10 years, we've seen another wave. Um, we began uh, to take more and more inquiries from people in communities who wanted to have a food co-op in their community. And so we joined with the National Cooperative Grocers Association <laughs> and the Bank for Cooperatives, NCB, to form Food Co-op 500. Um, in order to, we have a vision of more and more food cooperatives being able to successfully serve their members. And Food Co-op 500 hopes to provide the resources to make it more likely that the startup efforts that you're involved in will successfully open for business and be around for the next wave of cooperative development whenever that should come along. Uh, what we want to do is share some of the successes and some of the failures of the co-ops that have gone before you in order to help you um, uh, figure out some best practices and uh, have some models and tools that will work and avoid some of the mistakes that the co-ops who have gone before you have made. Um, I'm really <laughs> glad that you're all here. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Stuart Reed, who will say a few words about Food Co-op 500 and today's webinar. Thanks, Marilyn. I am the uh, Food Co-op Development Specialist for Food Co-op 500. I just have a couple of little technical announcements uh, wearing my tech support hat. Um, that is that we're going to be using the um, question, the written question uh, format that is built into the GoToWebinar system today. Um, so if you just take a minute and look at that toolbar, you'll see that the bottom box uh, right above that, there's a thing there that says enter a question for staff. When you type something in there and hit send, uh, that's going to go to uh, Stuart and Marilyn and they're going to be um, they're going to be putting those in a queue for us for uh, during our session. So we're not going to have um, open voice privileges, but if we ask you to 
um, send in your questions via the written format. We will um, take care of as many of them as we possibly can. Um, we also are recording the session today, um, so we hope to make that available to you later. And also right now, just to let you know, we have um, just under 50 people on the on the call. Thanks for all coming. And kind of imagine um, yourselves in a in a room together. Um, and um, I guess get over the fact that we can't all actually see one another. We'll try and and uh, and still have a, a good solid social experience here. Um, so. There's the intro for technology. Um, getting into the program, uh, which is titled Governance and Accountability, um, there's three things that we're going to focus on today. I just want to um, give you them in a very broad sense so you can kind of hold them uh, during, the, during the session. Uh, the first is how uh, the principles of being a cooperative and governance and accountability go hand in hand. And the second point is that it's never too early to practice these principles. And the third point is uh, we're going to look at how to look at your startup structure so that it can transition nicely um, to the governance structure of a mature co-op and um, allow you to give that consideration um, now with the long view in mind. So those are our kind of our three um, uh, touch points that we're going to keep, keep with us during the session. And um, I've asked uh, four directors of startup co-ops to help me with that. And I'd like to take a minute uh, now for each of them to um, have a minute to introduce themselves to you. Um, and first, I would like uh, Ed. Maltby to say hi. Ed is from the River Valley Market in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, hi, this is Ed Maltby. I'm the president of the uh, River Valley Market in Northampton, Mass, and we've been uh, working on this now since 1997, or 1997 when a few of us got together to do that. And we're, up, we're hoping to open our doors in May of this year. Um, and uh, we went through a long process with financing and finding sites and everything else. But um, we are now ready to start shopping in the spring of 2008. That's great. Thanks, Then Thanks so much for coming on the call today and uh, on this topic, Ed. I appreciate it. Uh, next, uh, Ron Griffith from Just Food at Northfield, Minnesota. Ron, can you say hi to us? Hello, uh, I'm Ron Griffith from Just Food in Northfield, Minnesota, as was just mentioned. Um, I joined the work on our co-op in the spring of 2002. We were able to open our store in December 2004 as a result of the great work of Stuart Reed, the very person on this phone call and therefore have had our store open now approximately three years. All right. Thank you, Ron, and thanks for uh, coming on the call and, and sharing your your story with us. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Ken Bowles from Sierra Vista Market in Sierra Vista, Arizona. <laughs> Good morning, Mark. This is Ken Bowles, and I'm on the board of the uh, Sierra Vista Co-op, uh, Market Co-op, and uh, We've been uh, working on opening a market for oh, a little bit over a year. Uh, we have no grocery store in the west end of Sierra Vista. And so uh, since no commercial market was willing to come in, we said, well, we're going to open a co-op. And we worked first with uh, Bisbee, uh, Arizona, and uh, they said, well, why don't you make your own? Yeah. So I joined the uh, co-op effort uh, all about a little over a year ago. We had a lot of other people who were already working on it and they had made a really good start. So when I applied for nomination to the board, hey, we made it. <laughs> but uh, we're moving right ahead. We got past uh, some of the real problems that we ran into with Arizona law. And uh, we're moving ahead. We've got a lot of community support. 
uh, we've got support from uh, even the, the owners of building of the building that we're looking at to move into. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're very happy about the progress we're making. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ken, and, and thanks for that introduction, and glad that you can help us out on the call today. Appreciate that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what. You know, I'm just going to, there's at least one person out there, a woman who just spoke, and if you could mute your line, and I hope that there weren't uh, 20 of you speaking <laughs> and 19 of you had your lines muted. Um, next up, uh, Ben Sandell. I don't know if I got your last name right, Ben. We didn't talk about that from the friendly city food co-op could you introduce yourself please yes you, know, you did get my name right Ben Sandell and um, we are working on opening our co-op in Harrisonburg Virginia we've been working on this about two years now and we're hoping for a spring 2009 opening um, and we incorporated last August we're up to actually the web page that you have up there. We're now up to around 185 uh, owner households, and maybe a little above that now. Um, so that's been going pretty well, in our opinion. Um, and we completed a market study. We're work we're moving forward into the pro forma financials, and we're looking towards the member loan drive to begin. Well, to to start the process of getting that going. Okay. Thanks for that intro and for joining us today. Appreciate it. Sure and so now that we have a sense of, uh, of those folks, I'm going to get this uh, slide presentation going here. And just bear with me for a moment to kind of get all my um, pieces together. So um, next thing up, we're looking here on page two, in case you're following along with the printed or the um, PDF version. Uh, at the slide titled uh, Outline for Today's Session. So we're going to take kind of a broad stroke uh, at the beginning and ask the question, why does this matter? Meaning, why does governance accountability matter? Um, we'll be looking at uh, the development model that Bill Gessner presented um, in the first session of this series, um, the development model for the Food Co-op 500 um, process. Uh, we're going to look at governance principles, the idea of cooperative accountability, uh, structural progression from um, how to organize yourselves and think of yourselves um, uh, in the startup phase and how that connects to um, the mature uh, governance uh, structure. And then we've thrown in a few key ingredients and uh, we have extra bonus features. So <laughs> I hope that keeps you on the edge of your seat as we... Uh, move forward here and bear with me I'm just I have a slightly different setup with my monitors today so um, now we're looking at why do these things matter it's a question um, governance and accountability and I'm going to suggest that we answer the question with another question which is what does it mean to be a co-op so um, as I was preparing the governance and accountability material, it seemed that really um, giving us time to to recognize that being a co-op uh, means that we have an organization with underlying principles and values, and that this is uh, these really speak to the essence of how we're organized and how we go about doing our work, and that those values um, really take us to a place that. Um, help us see that some things are are not going to be okay as we move forward in our organizations and yet we're still mission driven so there's a lot of stuff that we're trying to do um, and yet we're we're going to be doing uh, doing that work um, with um, consideration to how it's done and um, third 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 thought here is that while these underlying principles and values and our mission, maybe our shared vision, all bring us together and, and create um, a lot of common uh, foundation for us, it's true that we don't agree on everything and we should honor that and have that be part of our strength as a co-op and yet we still get to ask the question, well, if that's true, 
how do we move forward together? And to me, these questions about how, how do we move forward together <laughs> given shared principles and values, a shared mission, and yet incredible diversity in our membership um, really are answered through the governance and accountability principles and practices. So that's part of um, how I get to this idea of, of co-ops and governance and accountability being very closely connected. Um, my background is I served on the board at the Brattleboro Food Co-op. It's a small town of about 10,000 people in southeastern Vermont, and the co-op's been around for about 30 years. Um, I served on the board for, for seven years, and somewhere in that um, period of time, we had this um, mind shift take place on the board that, that the board's view um, ought not be just uh, focused on the store, as is kind of illustrated on this first picture here, and we're looking at the slide that's titled From It's a Store to It's a Community. Um, this picture represents a change in perspective um, that we underwent as a board, and we started to look at, well, what does it mean to see our role as governors as having this responsibility to the community that we're serving and the co-op community, and then acknowledging and, and you know being real about the fact that that community owns the store. How would that change you know, how we spend our time, how we're organized, what we think about, and what we talk about? So obviously it's a, you know, kind of the essential co-op um, uh, perspective, being a business that's owned and controlled by the people who use it and that we're working together to meet our mutual needs. But how I, how I would suggest in, in a startup effort is you know you probably see that community circle and your and your rallying resources to start the store, and it might be hard to actually see well how many members are we talking about and how are we we responsible to them, and you know here in Brattleboro I'm just still amazed at the number of people who continue joining. I mean like I said we're a small community of you know 10,000 we are kind of a hub for the region but. The membership just continues to grow, and we're at you know 4,500 members. And I'm sure if the startup uh, founders uh, of the co-op 30 years ago were asked, you know, is that possible? It would be pretty hard to fathom. And yet, it is part of our co-op's vitality and uh, helps us to take this kind of community orientation um, as a as a governing body. The next slide, um, entitled "The Cooperative Principles." Uh, is is there for for your benefit? Bill mentioned it in his in his um, his presentation on the development model. And what I remember, Bill, that you said was, you know, this this these principles alone can be um, c can be the focus of a lifelong learning uh, experience. And I would just like to support that approach, especially if you're serving on the board, and especially if you're you're um, you're helping a startup effort get off the ground. And a book that I just can't recommend enough uh, is this book on the screen here, Weavers of Dreams. Um, it is a, a historic account of the um, folks that came together in the 1840s and created a model that was uh, not only successful but um, able to be replicated by co-ops uh, at that time, and that we are uh, still connected to the principles that they, that they developed in, in the 1840s. And um, their story is so profound for startups, I think, because it really speaks to this idea of um, what difference are we trying to create in our communities, and uh, you know, why is this effort that we're putting out really, um, really going to be worthwhile? So, this slide that we're looking at, which is what difference are we trying to create? It's pretty basic, right? But um, it is important for us to um, take the long view to look at what is the vision that we're that we're um, you know, marshalling our resources uh, here to, 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 you know, to produce. Um, and so, you know, feel free to print that out and, and doodle on it as, as, uh, as you would like. Um, Marilyn, in her introduction, 
spoke uh, about the history of co-ops and I wanted to just bring this idea really into um, the governance and accountability um, context. Um, this slide will be probably a little difficult to, to read on your screens. Um, I just want to point out what some of the pictures are. So this pink line here that peaks in, uh, oh, say 1945, that's the, the, the peak of, of the number of co-ops that were present from the old wave that started during the Depression. Um, obviously, Marilyn pointed out that uh, not very many of them are still around. Um, this peak here in the 1970s shows, that's the, um, that's the green line, um, that shows the high point of number of, of, of uh, co-ops that were started out of kind of the natural food movement, and it numbered up as high as almost 700 uh, in the same range as the number of co-ops that were present out of the out of the old wave. And here we are, um, let's say today, that's this line right here, and you can see that there's been a downward decline over the last um, 30 years from that peak. Um, the question is, well, why aren't some of those co-ops still around, and how can you learn from, from not only that there was a, a peak, but there was a decline? Um, how, how can you take advantage of, of that kind of you know, history to know um, about how to help start your own co-op? This shows um, really a very, um, oh, not an optimistic uh, trend line here after today, right here, this, is, this would be the effect of your work, where are the number of startups, um, and I, I hope that we can support your work and that trend line can, can uh, come up and be sustained. When we look back at the, the Rochdale pioneers, the people who are addressed in the book Dreavers of, or, uh, Weavers of Dreams, you know, that book was produced in the 1990s, and it was the 150th anniversary, and they can trace, you know, the the, the connections to other co-ops directly from from that one. So I, I hope that that your efforts have that type of um, of longevity. We're going to pause here in just a second, but at first I would like to um, uh, review these strategic concepts for the guidance of of cooperatives. Um, this material. Uh, Marilyn addressed uh, last week as part of the member uh, best practices. Um, there is a, a, a link to it in the resource packet that's on the, um, the website for the series. It's pr material um, prepared by a guy named Brett Fairbairn. He's, um, he's up in Canada and he's obviously doing a lot of thinking about what it means to be um, a successful co-op that's thinking about uh, its strategic future. I'd just like to review these three concepts here with you um, for a minute. Linkage. Um, why do members invest capital, time, and loyalty in their relationship with a cooperative? And what Fairbairn is, is suggesting is that there's a dual nature to the co-op. They trust that their investment will be worth it to them as an individual but they also see how the co-op is benefiting the whole. So there's a self-interest and there's awareness of the interest to other members. And this connection, the more real that you can make that, um, and as we move into the ideas of governance and accountability, how we can actually speak to it um, and hold ourselves accountable to it uh, is, is part of what will help make successful co-ops. Um, this next notion of transparency is um, it's a really interesting one because I think it gets mistranslated so easily at the board level, and I'd like to just kind of share uh, you know my thinking on it. What he's talking about is that uh, individuals' interests and the in interests of other individuals in the co-op that those interests must be transparently uh, apparent. <laughs> you might say members need to see that what the co-op is taking on is what they're interested in and what the other individuals in the co-op are interested in. And this idea of, of being a good agent um, is so key so that the, the, the members are really looking at you, 
the co-op and themselves as one entity really moving forward. And they can see it by the way that you are conducting your business and um, paving the way for the future. This last idea of cognition uh, is so uh, relevant, I think, to the startup effort, which is really it's asking the question, how does your co-op think? And how does it just, you know, go through that thinking process together as a group and move forward as one entity? Um, in a minute, we'll take a look at the uh, development slide uh, regarding vision. And it's just, you know, rich with, um, um, with the need for uh, a learning organization, one that is, that is adaptable um, through time. So these ideas of linkage, transparency, and cognition, I think, are really embedded in what it means to be a co-op. And um, I would really encourage all of you to, um, to print out Fairbairn's document. It's about a 20-page read. And um, the first time that I did it, it was um, very difficult reading. Uh, couldn't quite get into it. And as I kept going back and back to it, I could see that what he was talking about was so important for us to be aware of. Um, and I wanted to share that with you. So um, now I'd like to, to um, ask uh, Ed and Ron and Ken and Ben uh, in particular, um, you know, what do you think about this idea of, of leading off uh, governance and accountability topic by first focusing on what it means to be a co-op? Um, Ed, would you, would you care to respond to that? Um, uh, yes. Uh, um, oh, you know what? Hey, Ken, I, I asked Ed first, would, and uh, you hold your thought there, and, and uh, Ed, you go first. It'll be a little hard for us. You Watch my arm waving, OK? <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, it's exactly where, where we're at um, in Portland, Maine, and we're forming um, Portland Food Co-op here. Oh hey, uh, uh, is your name Ed? Oh yes, I, I'm sorry. You're. you're uh, oh, you know I, what, Ed? I actually didn't know uh, who yeah, I didn't know who you were, and I was actually referring to Ed Maltby uh, from the River Valley Market uh, Co-op in Northampton. Of course, I'm sure. I'll sorry, thank you. <laughs> you ready, Mark? Yeah. Um. You, you want to talk about the idea of the co-op uh, as being more than a store, um, and that's really been the basis of how River Valley Market, you know, the uh, legal name is Northampton Co Community Cooperative Market. Uh, we've been based very much in looking at the benefit of the community. When we first started looking at having a store, we weren't short of places to buy whole foods or natural foods or even local foods. We have a fantastic buy local program in the valley here and plenty of farmland. What we were looking at is securing the ownership of some of those resources uh, for the community and for the betterment, long-term betterment of not just the urban community but also the surrounding agricultural community that was seeing some of its markets disappear with uh, the increase in um, uh, globalization and industrial farming. Um, and as you were reading through the whole uh, um, piece about longevity, you know, we started in 1997. We're going for our doors in 2008, so we certainly know what it's like to be uh, persistent. But during that process, we built a great affinity with the community. We've got somewhere over uh, about 2,100 uh, members, even though we haven't got a store. We raised over a million dollars in in member loans uh, only on the basis that we had a site for a store. Um, and we have found that by keep going back to the community as a group and looking at the strength of that community and not assuming that uh, they wouldn't be able to accept bad news, they wouldn't be able to accept failures. Um, we've been through four different sites and in the end had to decide that we should be our own developer, which has created other problems. But uh, I, I think the the message that we had was that the community wants us to succeed at a project that they decided to do. We had the opportunity to go 
10 miles down the road in the community we went back to our members and they said no what we want is an 18,000 square foot store in the Northampton area that is big enough and strong enough to be able to be sustainable and in future years set up satellite stores um, and that has been our biggest asset both in raising money uh, getting participation from hundreds, literally hundreds of volunteers, and also surviving some, some very big setbacks. Okay, okay thank you, Ed. Um, ben, do uh, you have anything to add on the idea of, of uh, leading off with governance and thinking about what it means to be a co-op? Um, I guess uh, we're um, not nearly as far along and on a much more modest scale than what Ed just described, but uh, I resonated a lot with what he said, that um, we're still, I'd say, in the process of kind of helping our community understand exactly what a cooperative is, what it looks like, what it, how it operates, and how it's governed, but the community's been really receptive to that, and I think there's some good other models around here that are similar in that there's agricultural co-ops and, and credit unions that are quite strong. Um, and we're getting feedback from people, both members and prospects, as we, as we you know, are talking to different groups that we're going out to speak to. And they're really, really, they seem to really get the idea that it's not just another store, but it's a whole different kind of community organization and the benefits that that's going to bring to the community. So that's that's been uh, quite heartening. Um, and uh, along the lines of what Ed was saying about the community getting, being with us through challenges, the biggest challenge we've had so far is finding that we kind of messed up our, um, we started selling our, our equity shares before we were truly legally allowed that uh, in the eyes of the state of Virginia. But there was a process for that, which involved us going back to every one of our members at that point and saying, we're, we apologize, we made a mistake. If you want to leave because of this, we're happy to accommodate you, or you can sign this new paperwork and uh, understand that we now know how to do it. And every single one of them signed and went forward. We didn't have anyone who uh, said uh, that that was a big problem for them. Uh, and that was really nice to see that they were willing to kind of take a minute to think about our process and our governance and our incorporation structure as a cooperative rather than just a regular old business. Mm -hmm. um, nice. Yeah, thank you for that, Ben. Ken, uh, have anything to add there from Sierra Vista on this idea of, of thinking of a co-op first before we get into governance and accountability? <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting because uh, we're in a rural community and we have a Silver Springs Valley Electric, which is our uh, source of electricity, and that's a co-op. And so we get uh, we get lots of benefits from that, and it's it's locally owned, of course. And so when uh, we go out and uh, offer a membership for our co-op to people in the in the community, they're pretty well familiar with the idea of a co-op, and. I, I don't know. I joined this co-op because uh, I'm not going to be here forever. And I wanted to leave something to make my community better. And I think many of the people who are uh, members and who have joined us, uh, I think there are about 388 now who who are signed up, um, have the same vision that uh, many of them are elderly, that they uh, want to do something for Sierra Vista to leave it better than it, than it has been in the past and to actually contribute to a grocery store that's going to be here for the long time, the long term. And um, it's going to be locally owned. Um, and that that's a big selling point. And then the other selling point is that we're going to be able to purchase locally which uh, the big supermarkets cannot, and actually contribute to the growth of uh, agriculture here in, in our community and in our county. Mm -hmm. So, so <laughs> those are all benefits that uh, that we see from our co-op, and I think our members do too. 
because uh, many many of the members have signed up at the farmers market here that we have here in Sierra Vista every Thursday, and uh, so they kind of understand the, the local uh, availability of of foods and services here in the county. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Ken, for that. Uh, Ron, before I ask you, I also want to layer in another question from uh, our participants uh, that that goes hand in hand with this question and also the our whole topic for today. And that is um, we have already established our bylaws and uh, voted and we so we have an entity, but that they're struggling to fill the positions for for the board. What guidance would you give? And what impact does the lack of fully functioning board have uh, to do with the core group? And you know, I kind of for for this point of where we are in the in the in the topic, I think you know, let's hold that into this question of well, how does that relate to you know, what does it mean to be a co-op? Um, this idea of you know, how do we get people to to be interested in serving? Um, Ron, you want to take that one? Mark, I'm a little confused as to exactly which question you're asking. Well, let's start with the first one about leading off with what it means to be a co-op and how that relates to governance and accountability. But I kind of want to, uh, and and as a, as a secondary question, we'll have this, you know, um, and how do we inspire uh, folks in the community to, you know, participate? Okay, I, I I think I think I can tie them together. First of all, let me just affirm everything that the other participants have said. Uh, and I won't repeat it, I, although I think you've not yet heard the word trust come in. And what I think was central to what I heard them say, and certainly our experience, was that as we began to organize, we were um, very much trusted by the community in part by um, what they wanted the co-op to be, we, um, we seemed to be. And secondly, our actions you know, were consistent with, uh, with, with, with our talk. And so to kind of bridge into the second topic, I think the folks that have stepped forward have done so because, um, as was being said um, earlier, they saw this as an opportunity to make a difference in a community about which they care very much. And a number of them have done that uh, some degree of personal um, sacrifice, but uh, feeling that it was worthwhile to, uh, to, to make that difference. Yep. There you go. So I think it's it's actually just building building the story, and you know it starts with a few people, and then you can expand out as as the um, shared vision begins to overlap and connect it with more and more people, and then you're kind of holding up a flag saying, and we have uh, we have need for people to take leadership positions, which a little bit later we'll see how that really ties into the the structure of of governance. Um, um, going from the startup to the to the mature uh, picture. Another question that came in uh, has to do with the idea of a co-op as a learning organization, and I think that is such a great question. It really um, is what Fairbairn addresses um, directly by including the idea of cognition as one of the three strategic concepts. Um, there's kind of this built-in requirement of, of asking questions. How can we serve our community? What are our member needs? How do we do what Ron uh, described, which was being connected and then having our actions follow through and deliver results that are connected back to um, the ideas that came out of the membership? Um, and these, it, we work with boards all the time in, in, in co-ops that are ongoing how do you um, keep that learning concept alive? What are the ideas that um, need to be present in the conversation at a leadership level, um, at an owner level, uh, for your co-op to remain uh, relevant? And it's as simple, really, as looking at the world around you and asking, you know, how does this relate to our members? How does it affect the uh, health and well-being of the future of our organization? Um, and then I guess there's that other aspect to it, which is um, let's take as a given 
that we don't know everything that we need to know and that part of that knowledge is going to come from you know building dialogue uh, with others and 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 thinking and that that's uh, actually okay um, so and, and uh, let's see if that can build up uh, throughout the, the the session as well and it's a great question about learning um, so here we are organized for success what does it mean to govern effectively on behalf of others and what does it look like for accountability to be present throughout the organization and be part of the culture? And oh, this is interesting. Often, you know, sometimes we hear about accountability as a blame thing. Well, who's accountable for that? And, and you know, it's in the media is like something that isn't good. And um, our use of the word accountability is actually a very positive use, which is how do we see accountability as present? Um, from the early days of a startup all the way through to a co-op that's been around since the depression you know and or you know since since the 1840s I guess um, so to kind of create a, a, a context for that we're going to do a very quick uh, review of the material that Bill presented um, and they're on the right side of that slide that I meant to type full presentation of this material was done at the first session and those slides are available um, online. This is the four cornerstones and three stages model and as I was preparing the governance and accountability session I went back and looked at this and went wow well let's you know just step through this when we look at this uh, vision the uh, idea what's represented on this page is is a very dynamic um, picture we're talking about um, about being in touch with with common problems of groups of people, um, building a shared vision over time, um, being inspiring, connecting hopes and dreams, and and to me this is saying, look, this is a very dynamic process. We need to be aware of that, and it ties back to that learning um, question. You know, how do we foster the kind of creative spirit in a way that can be fun and satisfying and 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 um, and actually relevant to the planning process. This next cornerstone of talent, um, you know, we look at all the names on on this page and or all the types of people, and we see, wow, there are a lot of people involved. Um, let's let's be aware of that and be intentional about um, clarity of roles, uh, who's responsible for what, how do they know, who they're accountable to, and how that kind of structural um, orientation helps us move forward um, with as much clarity uh, as possible. We're looking at uh, the cornerstone capital and just looking at that going, wow, this effort is going to take a lot of resources. You know, we're talking about using resources here to create something. Um, uh, there's going to need to be uh, accountability to be able to ensure that these resources are being um, you know put to their best use um, or that you know they're being uh, well spent or well allocated and you know there's not only financial resources here but the the time and effort of all of you and all of the other people who are included in your startup um, definitely should be counted in the in the um, in the capital and resource category um, we're looking at this slide about systems and saying, gosh, it looks really complicated. It's complex. There's many, many layers. Um, when I was talking with Ken on the phone yesterday, you know, we were talking about how, how there's just so much to do and, and it's, and it's so complex and yet, um, it gets more complex through the stages. And even after the business starts, uh, the complexities don't go away. So, the point here is from a governance point of view, from an owner representation point of view, how do we create a perspective and organizational structure to allow this complex system, set of systems to be, um, to, to be not only managed well, but also um, connect, have them connect into this accountability flow that goes up to ultimately the member owners. Um, so. It doesn't get really any less complex, <laughs> no. I don't think. Um, so in addition to these, to these cornerstones, we have stages. 
And uh, this is, we're not going to go through all the stages, but we're going to really focus on this stage one organizing. And in a call after Bill's uh, session, he was just, you know, sharing with me that, that um, well, it might be different in your, um, in your specific situation that usually or the recommendation is for incorporation to happen at least by the end of stage one and as early as possible in stage one. You know, how it looks specifically in your situation is going to depend on, on how you're organizing yourselves. But the idea is that pretty soon in this complicated process, incorporation happens. And when incorporation happens, then you have a board. And, um, and part of what we're going to be looking at um, next here is, OK, well, now that we're out of you know, the hope and dream you know, with a few people and we've actually got a board, how does that change our association to you know, governance and accountability? Um, so I really like the idea that this stage one organizing, the last point there on the page, you know, brings about the organization. It makes it real. Um, not that it's not real before you incorporate, but by incorporating, you are kind of putting a stake in the ground saying, um, all right, we're ready for the next thing. So next thing being, hey, we're going to take this governance principle, set of governance principles seriously. Um, they're going to be part of what um, helps us make a thriving local co-op. There's four right now that we're going to touch on. And um, the first one is the idea of trusteeship. Let's pause here for a second and go, gosh, we're going to talk about governance principles. You know, isn't it more important that we, you know, work on getting more members and all this other stuff we have to do for a startup? And of course, the answer is, yeah, you have to actually do all the worker bee steps. But this governance, the governance principles really are important to pay attention to from the beginning. And we'll see how they can tie in to your um, kind of structurally. So the board has a moral and legal responsibility to act as trustees on behalf of others. So there's two parts here, the moral obligation. Well, the really cool thing about a co-op is that our ownership is really clear. When people sign up to become members, they become owners. So we may also feel an obligation to others in our community who aren't members, but always our primary obligation is going to be to, um, to the member owners. Um, in some organizations, that relationship between a board and its owners is less, um, is less specific. In the co-op's case, it's, it's very specific. And we can connect all of the co-op principles uh, into this idea of, of, um, of moral responsibility. The legal responsibilities are very clear. And um, you know we're not going to do a legal roles and responsibility board training on the session. But um, by incorporating, you are saying to the rest of the, the, the people in your state, particularly because the state law tends to govern these things, hey, we are going to abide by the laws set out to govern um, uh, uh, our cooperative. And as a board, you want to make sure that you understand what they are and that you can demonstrate to your member owners that you are abiding by, by those obligations. Um, the bigger sense of trusteeship, of course, is to connect back to the whole idea of of uh, why we are here in the first place and be able to demonstrate that, yes, we are um, doing our jobs as stewards of this, um, of this vision and helping move it forward. Uh, the next governance principle, group authority. Um, this this uh, is really neat <laughs> and yet pretty complicated. How do we come together as a group and um, and make decisions and and lead together when uh, when you know we ourselves even in the small group on the board are quite diverse? How do we do it? Um, it's essential that your board can answer the question and that you really focus on your internal process. 
how you're going to take in information, discern, deliberate, decide, record, all that stuff, and that you, as individual directors, own the idea that, as an individual director, you have no authority whatsoever. That the authority comes from the group's voice, and that puts the burden on the group to be able to really work together to be a, a, a leadership entity. Um, the other level that I think is so cool when we talk about group diversity is when we connect it back to the concept of trusteeship and say, well, you could actually say that this group diversity is really about them at the member level. So, you know, if you've got, you know, 50 members, let's acknowledge, wow, what a diverse pool of people. If you've got 300 members, wow, it's a lot more diverse now. In our case here in Brattleboro, we've got five, you know, 4,500 members. It's very diverse. How does the board go about its job to distill from that group diversity a strong leadership position that can move the organization forward? Um, and take as a given that you can only do that um, together as a group and not as an individual director. So it's quite a, quite an interesting. Um, uh, challenge, I think, and should be part of the board's um, uh, training and and process building early on so that you get really good at it because it makes a difference. Um, effective delegation. So by definition, the board isn't going to do everything, <laughs> right? So let's be clear that the board is really going to be uh, really good at delegating and because um, just say we're not going to do it all and in fact in, in the end and maybe even in the beginning the board doesn't do a lot at all it, it's really thinking it's judging it's it's uh, it's doing these things safeguarding owner values empowering staff um, this third point is is so incredibly important the idea of when it delegates it only delegates to one uh, point sole point of delegation um, the story I have about that is I was working with a board and they had just done this incredibly, you know, elaborate kind of strategic thinking and planning process and every item on the to-do list, there were, you know, multiple responsible parties and, you know, a lot of stuff ended up not getting done. And um, th that's the reason that you have this single point of, of delegation is that the person, is, the delegatee is clear, I elect to receive and uh, it can be effectively reported back um, to, the, uh, to the, the next level when it's, when it's time. So this idea of delegation takes a lot of practice. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, accountability. So the accountability here is to the membership. So basically the bylaws are going to say, hey, we are going to authorize the board to get stuff done here and the response is then that the board is accountable to the members to see that this happens and the broadest two ways that we think about them are that value is produced so i think of that as organizational accomplishment happens and while that accomplishment is happening we avoid conditions that ought to be avoided, <laughs> right? We are staying out of trouble while we produce the value that the members have uh, signed up for. So how about a, uh, a mark break? <laughs> and um, I wonder if any of our, of our four um, directors uh, want to pick up on any of those. Let me just go back to our um, governance principles. We're going to go into cooperative accountability here in a second. Um, Ed or Ron or Ben or Ken want to comment uh, briefly on any of those four principles and how important they are as a startup? Um, well, I know that <laughs> uh, we, we use a, a website to keep our members all informed of what's going on. It's a rather elaborate one and gives pictures of all of the board members and what's going on and, and we update that very regularly. Uh, but to get the members together, we had we had luncheon the other day and we only had about 20 uh, members who showed up. <laughs> 
So uh, despite the fact that we'd send out a message to everybody, uh, it's it's hard to reach out to them and uh, even to share with them what's going on because uh, they just, I guess, said put trust in the board <laughs> and uh, expect things to move ahead and expect things to go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the challenge of keeping the momentum going with members. Um, add your your 80% uh, uh, or 90% to an opening. Do you want to um, uh, build on that idea as keeping momentum going and as, as trustees? Yes, and keeping momentum going over nearly 10 years and with two or three failures does um, have its challenges. But I think one point I'd like to quickly address at the beginning, um, when somebody asked about how do you get organized, and what we did way back um, was to uh, go out for grant funding so we could have initially a coordinator that could help keep the momentum going because we recognized that the, in order to get people involved and start the membership, then uh, we didn't have enough resources within the steering committee we had before we incorporated. And we, we were also very lucky insofar as we were introduced to policy governance way back in the beginning, just after we incorporated and started using that model. So um, that was, uh, we, we were able, we were taught the level of um, responsibility and uh, how, to, how to share that responsibility without uh, infringing on the rights of others. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of anecdotal ones, you know, of our annual meeting, um, we actually brought in a mind group to uh, um, a, increase the uh, participation, but also so that our annual meeting would be a joyous event, so people would have fun. And uh, you know, the, uh, during towards the end of that meeting, then people were crying with tears uh, because they were so joyful about what was happening, and it brought a whole new level of uh, of. Um, uh, looking at the co-op as part of the community that can bring joy. It's not just pure hard work, we've got to slog, we've got to slog, we've got to get out there in the cold and the wet. And, um, and that was, you know, we've always had a very, very good outreach committee that went to the farmer's market, that we had uh, maple breakfasts and we've had soup uh, and pottery um, events where people would bring their own, uh, uh, make the pottery on site and then fill it with soup and so it's just being purely imaginative and innovative and thinking, you know, not portraying the co-op as some state political thing that is sort of very serious and intense. You know, it's fun. And when the store opens, people can have fun shopping as well. Yeah, I think that's really, um, really a great point. I hope everybody wrote down, make sure we have fun. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really critical. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna keep on trucking. Um, I want to move us into this idea of of accountability, um, and we're gonna build it up. Cooperative accountability. So as a cooperative, we are organized. We're an organization, an enterprise owned by and operated for members for the purpose of producing some common benefit. Accountability is the quality of being accountable, and accountable means giving a justifying analysis or explanation to prove a trust is fulfilled or an obligation is met. And Ron said, hey, where's that word trust? Here it is again. It was alive and well in Brett Fairbairn's um, concepts there about members having trust in the organization. And now we're actually talking about justifying that the, that the obligation is met and that the trust is fulfilled. So we're going to kind of take a closer look at that now. From the board's point of view, there's an accountability relationship with the member owners itself and its delegates. Um, the member owners, really, we've kind of started building that up with the idea of uh, expressing the governance principles. The, uh, Could you tell me what slide you're on, please? Oh, sorry. We're on the slide titled, Three Areas of Board Accountability. I. I, uh, last night, couldn't figure out how to add page numbers to what I'm looking at, so I can't give you the number. Um, this idea of, of, of accountability 
um, I want to just spend a minute here talking about the board's accountability to itself. Um, it's an idea that you need to um, develop as a, as a group and and having and and have really come alive um, rather than have it be something that requires policing and um, you know it's like the connection of group process and that fun uh, the the fun aspect that that Ed was just talking about and yet really owning the fact that to to move forward with this thing we're going to have to um, do what we say we're going to do. You know, Ron brought it up saying, hey, uh, we did, we, we followed through. We said, here's where we're going, and that's where we ended up. So that's a very important uh, part of your, of your, uh, of your accountability to itself. Well, excuse me, I, maybe the person who just asked what page we're on, you need to still uh, hit six there and mute your line back, or it might be someone else. Um, the board... I'm not sure how to um, clarify that with the. Um, there's so, someone, excuse me. Okay, thank you. Someone who's talking about opening up a can the other day needs to mute their line. Thank you. Everybody loves these things too. So the board has an accountability relationship with its delegates. We're going to see what that looks like uh, specifically as the founding team, and then after the GM is hired uh, here in just a minute. But you want to be thinking in these three areas as you're thinking about board accountability. They each have their own set of expectations. Um, next thing I want to do is draw for you uh, this accountability chain. Now we're on the slide that's titled Cooperative Accountability Chain. And if you're using a paper version or the static version, you'll miss the little drawings. But what I'm going to do is um, acknowledge that the member owners have authorized the board to move forward. The board is authorizing the GM or equivalent, and this is after you've hired one and you're up and running. There's further delegation uh, by the GM to staff um, for all of operations, and hopefully the result of all of that hard work will be that value is produced um, for the member owners. When we're talking about accountability, we're doing the flip side of the delegation chain. We're saying, look, probably there's going to be accountability built in here on staff regarding operations. This delegatee from the board level, uh, there's going to be reporting back to the board on um, on conditions and activities, and the board needs to be able to um, share back upstream to the member owners that it, in fact, is also um, fulfilling its accountability role. The next part here is to say, well, what is this value produced for member owners? Where does that come from? And here's where board leadership shared vision in concert with um, member owners is so critical because the, the better that we can define and talk and learn about what this value that's being produced really is, the um, greater the chance is that we will actually get it in the end. Um, so instead of getting whatever, let's talk about um, what it is that this cooperative is here to produce in advance and then we're going to actually hold the whole organization accountable for its production. What that might look like in a startup is actually very similar. Member owners are saying, hey, board, great, move ahead on our behalf. The board is in a position of delegating. The board does not need to say, hey, we're going to take this all on. That would be probably um, uh, too much work. The board is going to be delegating. We'd still need to make sure that we're fulfilling this accountability function from uh, the founding team and task forces back up to the board level. The board then needs to be able to stand up and say, member owners, here's where we're at. And then ultimately we want to see that all of these activities that are happening are for certain outcomes that we are defining um, in advance. Listening to this, 
because this is a lot of great pointing. Um, a lot of the questions they were asking at the meeting, the last meeting, of you on here, how to go um, about what we start. So through. now what I'm going to do is um, um, ha ask, ask Ron to... Um, hey. Ask Ron to demonstrate and kind of walk us through the structure that um, that they used at Just Food. And while Ron is doing that, I'll be reviewing the other questions that have come in. Ron, would you would you talk to us about this picture that we're looking at? I said you're my driver. Okay, hold on one sec, Ron. I'm trying to pick up whose voice is that um, is not muted. Can someone help me with that, Stuart? Yeah, Mark, I'm not sure how to identify the, the party that is speaking in the background, but um, someone who's having a conversation perhaps with someone that, uh, <laughs> in the room, try to be aware that you need to mute your phone. And you had a meeting last night. That's all we know. <laughs> okay, go, go for it, Ron. Well, what I have to say is by this point in the presentation, uh, this almost feels self-dependent, so I'm going to try to not belabor the point. But what I will say is that we found it just very, very helpful to, to see our organization consciously evolve. As you can see, at the, at the outset, because things were so murky, we frankly held the group on a kind of um, close. Uh, it, it was close. But as soon as as soon as we got to the point that we thought we had a vision that we could share and begin to enlist people in, in enlarging that vision, we flipped it to a totally open group. We had uh, the founding team always had as the first item of this agenda introduction of new people. So we tried to have it be as much as possible that that if you showed up, you were a part of the team. Uh, you didn't have to say, "I want to be part of the team." We just assumed you were part of the team. Um, and very shortly thereafter, we then did establish the board of directors when we when we incorporated. And obviously, that's a very different kind of group. It's clearly it's back to a closed group. That is, it has a specific boundary. So the truth is, we tried to have the board of directors do as little as possible, and that that largely meant delegating to to the founding team. Um, that's entirely consistent with what you've said to this point, Mark. And 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 in some sense, adds little other than to say. At that time, we sort of had thought we'd bumbled into this structure as a, as a new idea, and only later on discovered that it had the great benefit of the board of directors continues on, of course, to this day, uh, but the founding team we could get rid of when uh, it had uh, out, outlived its purpose, and it had outlived its purpose by, the, by shortly after the time Hank got Stewart on board as the GM. We were able to hand uh, things off to him, so the board didn't have to change its habits. And uh, golly, to us that seemed like kind of a neat trick, but you know, it's um, it's no silver bullet. But the, the the notion being, as you've said, you can't get enough people on the board to do all the work you need to do, and 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 so you don't want that board to be directly doing all that work. You want to have another group called funding team or whatever it is that can be very open and that you can get rid of after it's no longer needed. Uh, and in a sense, that's what that chart tries to say. Very yeah. obvious in retrospect. Yeah, and you know it's a neat trick, uh, Ron, and and I think we're suggesting here it's worth replicating because um, this structure of having the board be a governing body really from the beginning, as opposed to the body that has to do everything, get everything done, really allows the board to focus on what is our role, how do we think from the owner's perspective, as opposed to from the worker beach perspective on, you know, getting all these tasks accomplished. Yep. Yeah, Mark, exactly. And the truth is, even with those separation of roles, there's there's still plenty of struggle <laughs> to let go. Yep. And uh, this, this is just, just a, we found a help. Yep. And uh, an idea that people might want to give a look to. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, at the end, I'll show you where you can get a little resource packet that I put together. Ron um, wrote up um, the narrative of their kind of this, of this timeline, and it's a very nice uh, one and a half page description of the roles and functions of each of these groups and how they started. And in the case of the steering committee and the founding team, were then uh, terminated and and it's very well done and it's um, accessible to you very easily after after the session and um, we did that in case you want to print it out and pass it around 
but you know basically showing a group that was that early group started up it passed its baton to a larger group that took on a bunch of work including incorporating and after it incorporated the board really served a governance function from the beginning rather than um, uh, rather than being you know the the worker bee group um, we find that to be very consistent with the board role at a co-op after um, it has uh, you know a mature organization so we thought that the model was um, was really worth worth showing you um, now we're going to take kind of a different look uh, very same kind of story we're going to show two pictures and Ben if you can um, get ready this is Ben uh, Ben Ben's um, Sandel shared this picture with me it's the organizational chart from the friendly city food co-op it's how they're currently structured and after Ben kind of describes it a bit, I'll give you the second picture. Um, and just for your info, if you're following along, we're looking at a slide with the Friendly City Food Co-op in the upper right-hand corner, the first of two. So Ben, do you want to just give us a quick uh, review of, of the picture we're looking at? Sure. Um, we started similar to uh, the what was shown on the last slide, where we had a, a um, steering committee originally, which we kind of uh, turned into the founding team, kind of waved a wand over it, and poof, to the founding team. Um, and the way it is now uh, is um, we have, we seated a board at the time that we incorporated, as was required, of course, by our bylaws um, and by the incorporation papers. Um, and the board has basically delegated all of the uh, work, day to day work tasks of getting the, um, of getting the co-op started to the founding team while the board at this moment is really more concentrated on trying to learn how to be a board. Uh, and by that I mean trying to understand policy governance and kind of internalize it and get ready for, uh, the board is well aware that over time more and more is going to transition to it as the founding team, you know, once a general manager is hired, the founding team is going to become uh, I think drastically diminished in its function <clears throat> and the board will be interacting much more with the general manager uh, but at the moment we're at the stage where we have to get more we, we have to uh, complete the board we really don't have a full slate yet of board members um, and really get ourselves get ourselves fully understanding policy governance and how that's going to work mm -hmm. um, but because we have almost total overlap between the board and the founding team. There's a lot more people on the founding team, but the board members come for, have come from the founding team. Uh, it also means that the board is always present at all the member functions. Um, we hear, you know, we're, the board are the people primarily who are doing the talks to community groups and hearing their input. Uh, so it does give us a really good perspective on what our community wants and what they're expecting or hoping for the co-op. Um, one last thing I would add is fun has been something that we've worked really, we work very hard on fun uh, at Friendly <laughs> City. Um, and we're having our second annual giant party, which last year was the first one we didn't really know what to expect. And it was a really great, huge party, uh, more than our space could accommodate. Um, but that was a good thing. So, uh, and we found that that has been really great for creating a connection between our you know, developing organization and the public and our members. So, um, but yeah, so what the, the slide you're seeing now is definitely going to transition. Um, the board box will kind of get bigger. The founding team box will get smaller and ultimately disappear. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Ben. And I, I love the name Friendly City. <laughs> um, so when I saw this, I thought, all right, I totally get what's going on. And yet what I want to do is actually uh, address this this uh, idea here because when I look at it I say gosh I don't see the single point of delegation uh, as a which you know I really I really live that idea of, uh, of that governance principle so I redid their chart <laughs> sent it back to Ben I said Ben you know I think that that uh, you know keep doing what you're doing but uh, check your thinking and see if uh, this next picture um, might be one that you could move to where you see that this obligation between the members and the board 
is the primary relationship from the members authorizing the board to be its representative. It doesn't at all diminish the hard work and the important tasks that the founding team are doing, but it does clarify that their relationship isn't really directly to the member owners at this point, now that they have incorporated, that they need to be saying, hey, we're going to make sure that our work is judged first by the board because the board is the body that's accountable to the member owners. Um, so you still have the same amount of work going on, the same amount of, of boxes on the screen, yet we've just moved the lines around a little bit. And um, I wanted to share that with you because it's very consistent now with how they can move forward in the next step of, uh, of hiring and replacing the, the founding team. So Ben, thanks for letting me um, tweak your drawing. I appreciate that. <laughs> and showing it uh, tweak. This picture here, we're going to just spend a minute on. This is a, uh, now for, for those of you, um, and it is not quite loaded up yet, um, it's a picture of, has ownership uh, in big capital letters, and um, it's a picture that I use to diagram the policy governance model, uh, which is a whole system of governance that a lot of co-ops, a lot of food co-ops use. Um, to, to organize their, their governing principles. And there's just a couple things I want to point out that it really shows that the board is, uh, is a subgroup and embedded in the ownership pool. Um, it's really not down here in operations. This is where um, all of the management responsibilities and day-to-day -day activities happen. Um, separating the board from all of that stuff here is this dotted line right here that represents the the governance position which is basically marking uh, the fact that delegation has occurred and what's going on there is the board is saying hey we're going to delegate the stuff and then we're not going to do the work very key part of delegating I'm delegating but I'm now not doing it because I delegated I am going to hold accountable um, uh, the people or the person that the work's been delegated to. Um, what is really neat about the policy governance system is that it has this uh, same idea of value produced on behalf of member owners as one of its key principles. It calls them ends policies. It's basically outcomes, results, impact, what difference we're creating. It's the kinds of things that um, startup uh, groups are talking about when they're out there in their community uh, sharing uh, with, with members and potential members what it would mean for their co-op to come into existence. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, techniques that we work with boards with, you know, that have actually ongoing co-ops is to imagine your co-op doesn't exist and what, what is it that you would want to create. Um, and it's this idea of value produced um, and even though it comes from uh, a store and all this day-to-day -day activity. Um, one more thing I just want to point out about this picture is that the expectations in policy governance that um, are expressed to its delegatee who's running the store, they're expressed using a constraint system, which is what these red lines are showing. Um, and basically, these are values um, that the board it has written down uh, when representing the owners, when it's saying, hey, as you go about your daily work, certain things are not okay, and, um, and that's how the, the, the limitation policies are, are set up in policy governance, They're describing conditions that are unacceptable um, as opposed to trying to make the long list of all the things that need to, uh, to, need to happen. That uh, in itself is, uh, uh, um, requires some, some board training. It's a big topic. It's a very powerful concept once, uh, once people get their head around it. Um, I just want to touch on a few more um, kind of philosophical points of governance. And these actually are, uh, have been expressed as foundations of policy governance. But I, I think we can really see them as being strong strongly connected to uh, what it means to be a co-op. Um, servant leadership, the idea that the board, the board's role as a leader 
is one that is greatly affected by its connection with the member owners. It's really serving the member owners and leading the member owners at the same time. It's a very interesting concept, um, one that requires uh, to go back to this idea of a, of a learning organization, um, one that one that shows very clear connection between the board and the member owners on an ongoing basis from a, a values point of view. Um, how do we invite in that conversation from the members so that they can continue to see that the co-op remains, uh, that it is a good agent uh, for, their, for their trust. Um, clarity of group values. Basically, in the policy governance model, it's all about values. We're always talking about, you know, our expectations as they uh, as they relate to the distilled values that come down from the member owner pool. Um, it's a very different idea than um, than the management process. It's really continuing to really own um, and live that ownership position. Uh, empowerment is uh, is really interesting in a way. I wanted to uh, use this example for empowerment. Uh, the idea of empowerment is to uh, delegate in a manner that maximizes the uh, the potential that might come from who you have delegated to. So that's what we work for in uh, when we're working with a board GM or equivalent relationship. And you could also take that same approach um, right now with the board and your steering committee or your founding committee. You're saying, gee, we want you to really go and figure this out. We're going to give you a lot of authority here, and maybe you'll want to express, you know, some some boundaries to make sure that um, things are being done within uh, within some limits. But what I wanted to share with you is the idea of bylaws, since you know member the, the bylaws are really owned at the member owner level, and sometimes you know we'll see a co-op that has uh, bylaws where the bylaws have spelled out how the board needs to really do its work. To the level of you know how it makes decisions or or you know at a very specific level, and in contrast to a set of bylaws that would basically be authorizing the board to do its work how it how it thinks it could do it best. Um, interesting contrast, you know the the bylaws that really describe and limit um, board activities are very long, and then the board has to really figure out, gee, you know, do we need to live with this or do we need to try and change them or whatever as opposed to bylaws that are structured from a point of view of saying, hey, board, we're giving you authority. You now have to go and organize yourselves for success. So um, you, the board itself is really in this empowerment zone coming down from the member owners. It's not just about empowering those below you. Um, accountability, we've, we've, we've already talked about at length. Um, uh, this slide is, is uh, further defining you know how policy governance work I'm not going to go into it in detail but I do want to point out this idea here these two reasonable interpretation and monitoring very very big and, and, and key concepts obviously the monitoring is about checking to see if our expectations have been met the reasonable interpretation is really about um, letting go of what you yourself as an individual want to see happen and judge based on what you think is reasonable very powerful concept that comes in handy from the governance position. Since you're not doing the work, you really don't want to try and tell people that they have to do it your way. And so you're in this position of, of judging from the position of an ordinary prudent person, you might say, which is what's you know embedded in the, in the legal structure. Um, this set of slides here, we've really talked about already, except for this idea, the last one, uh, and, and uh, we're on the results of an effective governance system. Um, what's key is that your board is structured so that it survives time, that you can, that you can create, say, institutional greatness and organizational wisdom, and even without you being on the board. Um, even without half of you being on the board, and that's a great that's a great thing about co-ops. You picture it as you're like, okay, it's an ongoing train, and directors get on and get off the train, and the co-op keeps going. How do you design um, leadership, wisdom, knowledge, um, accountability into your system? Uh, we suggest that you do it by having a governing system that people really understand that you can train on. And it, 
you know, ultimately is one that requires written, um, you know, everything to be written down. Um, okay, policy governance simplified. I just like to do this uh, first. It's based on ownership. Write down your expectations, delegate, and then part of the system is based on checking to see if our expectations are being met. Really simple. Um, figure out how to in include this type of thinking in your work right away. Doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, those steering committees and founding teams ought to be uh, um, having written expectations, understanding what their authority is, and be able to report back um, to the to the board um, based on them. I've got two slides here of kind of uh, key ingredients. One is um, um, recruiting new board members. This list is might be different from a list that you would generate if you were looking for specific skills like, oh, we need a lawyer, we need an accountant, we need a grocery person. Um, I would suggest look for these qualities and then figure out how to take advantage of resources in your community and nationally um, for your for your expertise, um, uh, print that out and take, <coughs> take it to your board and and see what you think about that. I have a slide here for uh, ingredients for effective meetings. You probably can generate a, another page or two of this material, but um, when I thought about it, these were these were some of the items that I felt were um, um, most important, the top level. Um, number one, really get those things in advance so people can come and be effective together when you're there. Um, we won't go through the whole list, but pay attention to your group process. It's really, 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 really important from the beginning. Oh my gosh, we're at the extra bonus features. We have three minutes. I want to ask um, any of my four panelists if they'd like to uh, take a, a minute to help us close, and I'll show some of our extra bonus features. Uh, Ed, do you have anything to share to wrap up? Um, in a minute? Uh, yeah, one minute only. Uh, only one minute. Um, have fun. Don't take yourselves too seriously. It's a very serious business. You've got plenty of help out there. Draw on professionals as well as uh, your local community. Um, ensure that you have uh, clear authority in who does what, where and when, and good luck. Thank you. How about Ron? You want to go next? Have any parting words? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just have to say uh, that that was just a great summary that was given. The the the, the words of the words of wisdom that have been passed along uh, just ring right from our experience, and they they can be they can be taken to heart with um, with good effect. Um, uh, let's fearlessly proceed and have a great time. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Ken, how about you? Any parting words? <laughs> my my only parting words are: you got to keep an open mind and and learn as you go along because you run into things that you never ran into before or never expected. And so, paying attention to the owner values and making sure you meet those, I think that's the most critical factor of all. Yeah, thanks. That's that's really great contribution. Ben, how about you? Uh, I don't really have anything else to add. It's been well covered. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, in wrapping up, I do want to point out um, this new resource here. I just want to put it up here on the screen. On the website, um, that we've been using for registration. If you scroll down to session three, I did put together a set of readings um, that you might find useful. It could have been four times as long. Uh, believe me, there's lots of great stuff for you to be reading and thinking about as it relates to this work. But um, I did keep it uh, to a manageable level and um, hope that you find the stuff in there useful. Um, thanks for your questions that have come in. Uh, if we didn't cover any, maybe we'll send you a note so that you get a specific answer to your specific question. How about that? There are a couple here I see we didn't cover, but 
in honoring time. I want to make sure we end on time, and it's, um, it's time to close up. Thanks for coming, and really celebrate your efforts. Uh, it's great work you're doing, and thanks for participating in this uh, in this series. Mark, before people sign off, I, uh, this is Marilyn Scholl again. I want to uh, also thank you for coming. I remind you uh, that there will be another seminar uh, in two weeks from today, but, uh, put on by Bill Gessner uh, ab about creating a development budget. Uh, that'll be February 6th. If you haven't registered, we hope that you will. Uh, today's material is, uh, is available on the website. Uh, a recording is being made, uh, which we hope we'll be able to make available to you, uh, assuming that all the technology went well. And lastly, there's an evaluation. We have three more um, webinars in this series, and the evaluations are really helpful to us in um, making sure that we're meeting your needs and, and providing you with the best information that we can. So please take a couple of minutes. I believe there's six questions. If you could answer those, we'd greatly appreciate it. So once again, uh, thank you for coming, and hopefully we'll. See you in two weeks.